Um, well, hey, let's, let's pray. We're already 10 minutes behind because we were troubleshooting there. So why don't we pray? And then we're gonna get into this fourth and final teaching that we've got in this series on a theology of work. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for, um, God, just who you are, that you are our creator, you're our God, and you are our father because of what Christ has done for us. And so, God, we come to you today as your children and just ask that you would meet us in this time and that you would use your holy word to speak to us. And Lord, um, we recognize in this room how important the topic of our work is. And today, Lord, I, I pray that you would help us to also understand how important the topic of rest is. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just open our hearts and open our minds and speak to us in this uh, time that we have together this morning. And we pray that this would benefit each of us and just cause us to grow uh, in who you've called us to be and how you've called us to live our lives before you. And we ask this now in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so part four this, this week, uh, the title of today's teaching is I Am Not a Machine. Um, I Am Not a Machine. Generally, there are two mistaken attitudes when it comes to how Christians are thinking about work, and, and certainly this is true of non-Christians as well, but um, one of these mistaken attitudes is to undervalue work. Okay, to be the type of person who just doesn't think that our work is all that significant at all. And so there are people who undervalue work, which can unfortunately lead toward idleness or slothfulness or laziness. And then the other problem, of course, is the person who overvalues work. And so where the, the one who undervalues work can be led into idleness, the person who overvalues their work can be led into idolatry. The first problem leads to a person becoming a sluggard and the second leads to a person becoming a workaholic. And both of these are huge, huge mistakes. Now, all of us in this room and every single person probably lean more in one of those directions than the other. Even as I'm saying all that, you're probably going, okay, I'm more like this or I'm more like that. Now, so far, what I've tried to do in the first three teachings in this class is I've really tried to just stimulate in all of us a passion for our work trying to help all of us to understand that our work that we do before the Lord, whether it's work in our own homes or it's work somewhere else for pay, um, that all of that really, really matters. And so for anyone who battles idleness or laziness or inaction or a lack of motivation, my goal so far has been to just try to stir your heart with a passion and a zeal for the good work that God has called you to do in the world. Because as we've talked about in this series, Human work, all good human work, is being used by God to contribute to human flourishing. And therefore, our work, your work, really matters to God. But of course, the danger, if we were to just stop there and, and uh, just have these, the first three teachings in this series, is that there would be a lot of people, and, and even a lot of us potentially, who would gladly give ourselves to our work unreservedly for the rest of our lives. And it would look like this. It would just be an endless commitment to work. No days off or hardly any days off. No vacation time. Totally consumed in our God-given tasks. Because some of us very easily and honestly quite joyfully become workaholics. Morphing from humans into machines. And God knows that. So God all the way back at creation gave us another task. He gave us another command. He gave us another assignment. In addition to the dominion or creation mandate of work, he gave us the command to rest. And so again, today's title is I am not a machine. Now, life is not less than work, but it is certainly more than work. Okay, we've been talking so far that work is an intrinsic part of who we are as image bearers of God. So, so life is not less than that, but it's certainly more, and God never wants us to forget that. Yes, our work matters. Yes, fulfilling that cultural or dominion mandate matters. Raising families, building culture, loving our neighbors by offering products and services that bless them, that all really, really matters. But so does food and drink, romance and making love, listening to music, except pop music, 
<laughs> watching sunsets, long walks with people that you love, conversing and daydreaming, hobbies and laughing and fun, exercise, sleep, and then of course, communing with God. These are all really, really important and these are vital aspects of what it means, or vital parts rather, of what it means to be a human. And without these sorts of things in our lives, we will suffer. And so God says in his holy word, this is Exodus chapter 34, verse 21, he says, six days you shall work, on the seventh day you shall rest. Or you shall Sabbath, the Hebrew word there is Shabbat. And so six days you shall work, God says, but on the seventh day you shall Shabbat. That Hebrew word, the most immediate meaning of that word is you shall stop. And so at its most basic level, the command of the Sabbath, the fourth commandment that God gave to his people after they came out of Egypt, the, the most basic idea there is stop working. You work for six days and on the seventh day, you stop. Work ends on that seventh day. Now, we need to make a distinction though between what we might call a day off and a day of rest because those two things are not identical. A day off is great and I'm very thankful that we live in the modern world where most of us have two days off out of every seven. That's kind of how a lot of our companies work and American culture works or the American economy works. And so it's awesome. We get two days off a week, but those days off are not necessarily the same thing as a day of rest because you and I can certainly still work on our days off. And in fact, that's probably what most of us do. Instead of going to the office or going out and doing your normal work, what do we do? Well, we wash the car. We run errands, we mow the lawn, we clean the house, we pay some bills, we do some shopping, picking up our groceries, etc. Now, that's not rest. That's just more work without a paycheck. And so there's a huge difference there between taking a day off from paid work and actually observing and honoring a day of rest. In previous times and places, the workaholic went by another name and it was a slave. The slave in previous days was the person who was not given time off, time to rest. They were forced to work nonstop, day after day after day. Now, of course, in the American experience, sometimes they were given a seventh day off. But generally, throughout world history, slaves were the only people who were forced to work without, uh, without a pause. It was the free person who had time to rest, who had time to worship their gods and had time to enjoy creation. And God's people knew something about being slaves, right? They were slaves for 400 years in Egypt. And it's not uh, insignificant then that after God delivers them out from under bondage in Egypt and brings them out from slavery under Pharaoh, that God, in giving them the law, gives them this beautiful gift, that's how the Jews would receive this, this wonderful day of rest, this Sabbath unto the Lord. And God wants us, even today, to still enjoy this gift of rest. Now, I, I do realize that the Sabbath is, at least keeping the Sabbath in a literal Jewish way, is not something that you and I are commanded to keep in the New Testament. And anytime you teach on Sabbath, Christians are going to be like, hold on, time out. Doesn't Paul say something about that? Yes, he does. Didn't, didn't Jesus violate the Sabbath? Yes, he did. At least violated the Sabbath as it had become in his day and age, which was burdened down with a whole bunch of man-made laws attached to it. So Jesus deliberately violated the Sabbath because, again, the religious elite had turned it into something other than what, what God had intended. Rather than it being a blessing, it had actually become a burden for the people of God. And so Jesus was undoing that. And yes, it is true that Paul says this in Romans 14, 5. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. And then again, over in Colossians 2, 16, Paul, Paul writes, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. So I'm not going to argue today that we as Christians who are in Christ Jesus are bound to honor the Jewish Sabbath, meaning 
6 p.m. Friday night to 6 p.m. Saturday night. In fact, throughout history, Christians have generally moved their day of rest and their day of worship to Sunday, which is the day that Jesus rose from the grave, and we see that practice as early as the book of Acts. But what I, what I want to communicate to us here today, and what I really hope you'll walk away with, is that the principle of Sabbath rest, that one out of every seven days, we are hardwired by God to just stop and to rest and to worship. That that principle is worthy of our honoring and our obedience. It is embedded in creation itself. The creation count, account says, of course, that the Lord, he worked for six days in creating and then even God himself stopped to rest. And so as image bears before God, that principle of Sabbath rest is critical for us to honor and to observe. So Sabbath then, seeing that it's rooted in creation, it's not strictly a Jewish thing, it's a human thing. Again, it's, it's part of what we need to flourish as image bearers of God. You and I are not machines. You and I do need to rest. And so I wanna spend the remaining time we have today just showing you kind of four different ways that Sabbath rest really matters. I wanna talk about the value of Sabbath rest. Why is this such a blessing? Why is Sabbath rest a gift, a good gift from our Father in heaven? Number one, I'll say this, at its most basic level, rest recharges our batteries, okay? At its most basic level, it recharges our batteries. Okay, we take our phones, which are awesome, and they can work like crazy and do a billion things very, very quickly, and we run these things to the ground all day long. But guess what? At the end of every day, if you want this to continue to function, what do you do? You plug it in and you leave, it, you leave it overnight and you wake up and it's ready to go again. If that's true of a machine, how much more true is it of us who are not machines? In Exodus chapter 23, verse 12, we see this idea connected to the Sabbath. It says, six days you shall do your work, but on the seventh day you shall rest that your ox and your donkey may have rest and the son of your servant woman and the alien may be refreshed. So, so notice the connection there. When you honor Sabbath, when you stop from your work, you are refreshed. You're able to rest and actually be refreshed. Now, today, it's almost taken for granted among, among people that rest is really, really important for our overall well-being. Um, any doctor that you talk to worth their copay would tell you, listen, sleeping is really, really important. Resting is really, really important physically, psychologically, emotionally, there's all sorts of negative health factors if we don't sleep and if we don't slow down. So we know that to be true, but God was giving this wisdom some 3,500 years ago to his people saying, you are going to actually stop and be refreshed one day out of every seven. Over in Psalm 127 too, we sort of see the opposite of the person who rests. It says this, it says, it is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. So notice what it's saying there, that, that if you're the person who's sort of burning the candle at both ends, you're rising super early and not going to bed till super late, he says, that's just in vain. Ultimately, it's gonna backfire, it's gonna hurt you. And he, he even says there that you're eating the bread of anxious toil. Rather than toil that's flowing out of her work, that's flowing out of a rested, healthy person, it's the person overrun with and consumed with anxiety. So again, this is kind of depicting the person who's burning the candle at both ends. Up at 6 a.m. to do day trading before you're off to work at 8, then you're back at home at 7 p.m., and then you're answering emails on your phone while you're lying in bed. And, and the reality is that that's how a lot of people are living right now. Right? For all the blessings that these things have become for us, the curse is that they allow us to work nonstop. And the expectations in most businesses and marketplaces have changed, unfortunately, where it's totally acceptable in many, many companies and many organizations 
to text people late into the evening or email them at night and you're expecting responses and you can get frustrated with your, your partners or your employees if they're not getting back to you. So a lot of people are just day in and day out working. They're doing it through the weekends. They're doing it in the evening. So we all need to be reminded that sleep is essential and resting from our work recharges our batteries. Rest is a gift from God. And sleep is arguably the most productive eight hours you spend out of every 24. Without it, you're, you're functioning on a fraction of the percent that you would be if you were getting good sleep. So again, at its most basic level, Sabbath allows us to recharge our batteries. And so one day out of every seven, we let our bodies and our minds and our emotions and our souls reboot before the Lord. Number two, rest puts work in its place. Okay, rest puts work in its place. What do I mean by that? In the ancient world, the idea of rest wasn't as obvious as it is to us today, okay? They didn't have neuroscience. They didn't have all these sleep studies and they weren't checking out anxiety levels and stuff. So it wasn't all that obvious that we just needed rest at least this often. Rest, especially for an entire day every week, seemed absurd to people throughout history. In fact, this is one of the things that the Jews were constantly mocked for. The idea that they would keep this Sabbath, that that mattered to them. Like, you should just work through that. Why do you people take a day off? And Jews were often considered lazy by other peoples that would look at them because they took an entire day off. But you got to think about the context back then and why rest would have been so hard. When you live in a largely agrarian society, meaning that everything is dependent on maintaining your products or, or your um your produce on your land, right? Your fruits and your vegetables, taking care of your animals. When everything is dependent on you doing that every single day, how hard is it one day out of seven to be like, we're just not gonna go tend the fields today. We're just gonna leave that and just kind of let, let it go for one day out of every seven. That was a terrifying pro prospect for people, right? Like what if animals get in and destroy my crops or, what if I can't get everything watered or sown or harvested in my six day work week? What, I, I'm gonna have to get back out there and do it on the seventh day. And so for somebody to actually take one out of seven days off was terrifying in this context. You can see then how for a person to actually honor and observe the Sabbath, saying one day out of every seven, I'm gonna stop working and I'm gonna rest. That was actually a huge step of faith. Right? That was a way of saying, you know what, one day out of seven, I'm going to trust that God is going to make sure that my crops are okay. I'm going to trust that God will keep things afloat even when my own hands aren't actively working in the field. So it was a way to remind them that their work was not ultimate. God is ultimate. And what a great reminder for us today. See, the workaholic, the person who can kind of never step away from the business or the office or the ministry, is the person who believes one of two wrong things, or both. The first way the, the workaholic goes wrong is by thinking that if they take their hands off the steering wheel, even for a moment, the whole thing's going to fall apart. So they believe at the level of their heart that they are the ultimate control over their business or their ministry or whatever, whatever work they're doing. So if they take their hands off for even a moment, the whole thing is gonna crash. But Sabbath rest reminds us that this is not true. We are not God. Sabbath rest reminds us that the world ran perfectly fine long before we showed up and the world is gonna run perfectly fine long after you and I are gone. We're not in charge of everything. God is the one who's keeping things running the way that they are. And Sabbath rest reminds the workaholic that our livelihood depends much more on God's blessing than it does on our own determination and our own diligence and our own hard work. After all, the most fundamental resources that any of us have, our life itself, our health, the mental clarity that you have right now, the social conditions that allow you to be successful, like lack of war or some terrible natural disaster or a pandemic going around the world, 
All of those things are outside of our control anyway. So we need to be reminded regularly that, listen, our success, whatever success we have, it's not ultimately dependent on our hard work anyway. Yes, our hard work matters, but God is the one who is keeping everything going. So again, the first mistake the workaholic makes is in thinking that they are ultimately in control. The second mistake, of course, is in thinking that work and the meaning and the success that they derive from it are the ultimate source of their happiness. Okay, some of us in this room, we love our work. You just love it. You're passionate about it. You're driven by it. You actually get a lot of joy out of it. And some of you might, might be like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I hate my job. It's miserable. But, but there are plenty of people, and, and I can confess, I'm this kind of person. I love what I get to do. I'm driven every single day to do it. I'm passionate about it. I never walk into my office and go, oh, what a drag to be here. I love it, and I enjoy it. And there are plenty of people just like me. In fact, I mean, like I read theology for fun. Like even on my days off, I'm like reading theology. Three of you just fell asleep when I, just by me saying that. Like you read theology, how boring. I love that and I love what I do for a job and I would gladly just keep on working every single day off. And so for me, the great temptation is to work too much and I have to say, stop, Daniel, stop. You need to stop this. And there are plenty of people like this that love their work and it gives them tons of joy and satisfaction. And people who are enjoying their work feel a great sense of accomplishment and derive a lot of meaning in their life out of what they are doing. And this is not just a temptation for CEOs or people doing what we might consider really significant work. A housewife can fall into this trap just the same. Her identity and sense of value and meaning can be wrapped up in having perfect children or having a spotless home that nobody ever sees disorderly. And she can become OCD about dust on the baseboards or a fingerprint from a toddler on a window. She can find meaning and identity and purpose wrapped up in her daily tasks and her work. So this is a temptation for every single person that again, we can, we can look at our work as being way too important. And so Sabbath and Sabbath rest reminds us that work is not the ultimate source of our meaning or, in our, or our happiness, excuse me. Let me say it this way. The workaholic is the person who makes the mistake of turning work into an idol. Whether she believes the work cannot go on without her or that her life's meaning and worth are wrapped up in what she does, work takes on godlike proportions in her life. Tim Keller wisely points out, and I'll put this up on the screen, you will not have a meaningful life without work. But you cannot say that your work is the meaning of your life. If you make any work the purpose of your life, even if that work is church ministry, you create an idol that rivals God. Your relationship with God is the most important foundation for your life. And it de indeed, it keeps all the other factors, work, friendships, and family, <clears throat> leisure and pleasure, from becoming so important to you that they become addicting and distorted. So work does matter, it really does, but it cannot become ultimate in any of our lives. Therefore, God says, stop, rest, set aside time as a Sabbath to the Lord our God, as the scriptures say, making him our priority and recalibrating our hearts and our minds one day out of every seven. Number three, Sabbath, Rest helps us to celebrate what we have rather than striving for what we don't. Now, this is one of the most overlooked um, values of practicing Sabbath rest is that Sabbath rest helps us to celebrate what we have rather than striving after what we don't. As I've explained uh, in part today, true rest is at least in part delighting in God. And by that, I don't just mean going to church, having family devotions or meditating on scripture, although that is a part of it. We delight in God through all those things. I wanna also say that you and I, we delight in God and we show our delight in God by enjoying the good things that God has given to us. The good things that we've been able to produce in cooperation with God in the world. John Mark Comer in his book, 
that I have over here today, Garden City, he writes this. He says, Sabbath isn't just a day to not work. It's a day to delight in what one Hebrew poet called the work of our hands, to delight in the life that you've carved out in partnership with God, to delight in the world around you, and to delight in God himself. Sabbath is a day to pull up a chair, sink into it, look back over the work of the last six days, and just enjoy. I love that. Now, the, the, the place that we get this idea from in the Bible is by looking to God himself, right? If you go back to the Genesis account, God is said there to work for six days and then on the seventh day, God rests, okay? He Sabbaths. Now, what do you think is meant there in that verse? Should we have the idea in our minds that God worked six hard days and he's like, man, I'm gassed, I'm totally exhausted, I can't go on another day, I must just rest, Well, that certainly can't be true of God. God never gets tired, the scriptures tell us. So that's not what that means. What the the idea there is that God rests is that when God got done with six days of creation, he looked out at what he had created and everything was good, meaning everything was delightful and beautiful and satisfying to the Lord. And in a similar way, you and I, when we work all week long and we're, we're, we're pouring our heart and our soul into it, working as unto the Lord and not unto man, when we get to the end of that work week and we Sabbath and we rest, yes, we recharge our batteries, like I said, because we're not God, but we also stop and we delight in the work that's been done over the last six things. The work that we did and the things that we were able to produce and create and the good gifts that are ours as a result of that work. And so a big part of our rest is taking time to delight in what we've created. Or to put it differently, to enjoy the fruit of our labor. We do this in our homes and with our families and through friendships and food and drink. John Mark Comer continues, and I quote, he says, when you enjoy the world as God intended, with a cup of coffee, a nap in the hammock, a good meal, time with friends, it glorifies God. It calls attention to the creator's presence and beauty all around us. And when you do all that in a spirit of gratitude, letting the goodness of your world and life conjure up an awareness of God and a love for him, then rest becomes worship. I love that. Unfortunately, most of us spend our days off busying ourselves with other things, not actually resting and delighting in the things that God has already blessed us with. A lot of us are spending our days off and our time off in the evenings, not reflecting on how much God has already blessed us with and enjoying all of that, but anxiously thinking about and trying to acquire more stuff. Um, Amazon has made 24-7 shopping a reality, right? Right? And I'm guilty of this. I'll be sitting there and I'll blow through an hour at night just adding senseless things to a wish list on, on an Amazon. And it's like, why am I doing this right now? Instead of being in my home, enjoying the many things that God's already blessed me with, what am I doing? I'm sitting there going, what more can I get? What more can I get? And there's this endless drive to accumulate more and more stuff. And Sabbath puts a halt to all of that. In fact, in Nehemiah 10.31, we learn there that The Sabbath day was a day in which we were not, or God's people were not to buy or sell anything. So all trading and buying and selling actually stopped on Sabbath because Sabbath is not about getting more stuff. Sabbath is about enjoying what we already have. And as we do that, again, as we do that, I should say this, as we do that with gratitude in our hearts, then that is actually a form of worship. We're saying, Lord, look at your goodness to me. You've given me this family. You've given me this home. You've given us these resources to do these things, to eat this food. It's a way of worshiping and honoring the Lord. Number four, and finally, rest reinforces ultimate rest. So why is Sabbath rest significant? Because rest, Sabbath rest, one in seven, reinforces our ultimate rest. Now, over in the Deuteronomy version of the Ten Commandments, 
A little Bible trivia. How many of you know there's a Deuteronomy version too? So you got the Exodus 20 version and then the Ten Commandments are repeated over in Deuteronomy because now you've got the second generation of God's people who are about to go into the promised land. That first generation died in the wilderness. And so Moses retells the story and gives them the Ten Commandments once again. But I want you to notice in the Deuteronomy version, I'm gonna put it on the screen here. Notice the reason given for keeping, given for keeping Sabbath here. It says this, observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So here in the Deuteronomy version, Moses is saying that, through the practice of Sabbath, God's people were actually going to remember the deliverance that God had worked for them. Remember, they were slaves in Egypt. They worked for Pharaoh 24 seven every single day from the moment they woke up to the moment they went to bed. It was work, work, work. And throughout their slavery, the work got worse and more intense and more grueling. That was their experience. And then God delivers them from slavery and God says, hey, one of the biggest blessings I'm gonna give you is something called rest. You don't have to work 24 seven anymore. And so for the Hebrew people, Sabbath rest was a reminder to them of the freedom that God purchased for them and the rest that God gave them from bondage and slavery under Pharaoh. Therefore, Sabbath rest is intended to remind you and me of the freedom that you and I have and the ultimate rest that you and I have in and through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's an already and not yet component to this, as there is much of the Christian life. There's a sense in which you and I already are living in the rest that Jesus provides for us. We see this, for example, in Jesus's beautiful words in Matthew chapter 11, where even in the call of salvation, Jesus's invitation is an invitation to rest. Jesus says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. So there is a significant component of rest that is available to every person right now when they come to Jesus. What does that look like? I would say first and foremost, it's rest from the anxiety of having sin in your life and guilt in your life and fear of judgment in your life. When you say yes to Jesus, all of a sudden you're at rest and you're at peace because you know none of that's true about you anymore. But more so, the way of Jesus, he's talking about taking his yoke upon you and and learning from him. The way of Jesus, the life of Jesus that we're meant to follow after and embody is a life of rest, a life of a uh, right relationship with God and with each other, a right relationship with our work like we're talking about today. And so actually, if we're living the way of Jesus, it's not a hurried life. It's not an anxious life. It's a life of rest. So again, there's an already component to this. And Sabbath is pointing us and continually reminding us that the way of Jesus is not a way of anxious toil. It is a life of rest and a life of worship before the Lord. But there's also a not yet component to this. Sabbath rest points us forward to the ultimate rest that you and I do have in Christ when you and I enter into the ultimate promised land. So just like Sabbath was rest given to God's people in the Old Testament when they were entering into the promised land, you and I are promised an ultimate rest in the ultimate promised land, the new heavens and the new earth. And we see this teaching over in Matthew, or in Hebrews chapter four, rather. Here's verses nine through 11. It says, so then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. 
Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. So there's a rest that is still promised for the people of God. And in that Hebrews passage, the author there is warning people against hardening their hearts and and moving into a place of disbelief like the Israelites did, and then they perished in the wilderness. And he's saying, no, 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 we need to continue to trust the Lord and follow the Lord Jesus because there is a promised land. There is an ultimate rest, an ultimate Sabbath that's waiting for us in the future. And so as you and I, as Christians, as we practice Sabbath rest one day out of every seven, we're retelling ourselves the good news of the gospel that, hey, there is a day coming when all work that's stressful and all work that's marred by sin, all of that's going to come to an end. And we're going to be in God's presence where all things are made new and we're truly and fully and wholly and completely at rest in God's presence. And so again, Sabbath rest helps point our hearts toward ultimate rest. So what I've shared today, these kind of four ideas about rest and Sabbath rest, honestly are just scratching the tip of the iceberg. There is so much to be said about Sabbath. Um, And I know even in conversations that I've had with some of you that that a lot of you have done a lot of reading and thinking about Sabbath, and this is an important part of your own lives. So we're just scratching the tip of the iceberg today. But what I've been hoping to do in this class today is just help us to see how important and how wise Sabbath rest is that God has given us this not to be a burden, but to be a blessing to our lives, to help us to become rested and to become intentional and to become worshipful in our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. And so in closing, let me just say this, that you and I, we really, really need God's help in in trusting and in believing that Sabbath rest is wise and it's good. Because I've talked to many Christians who who tell me, and honestly, this is how I used to feel before my family began to practice Sabbath rest. They, they'll tell me, that sounds awesome, but I just don't know how I could make time to rest like that. Like how could I possibly take one day out of every seven and just stop working? in order to delight in the good things that God has given to me and to worship. How could that possibly happen? In other words, for a person who's thinking that way, and maybe somebody here feels like that, Sabbath seems like a burden and not a blessing. You're looking at it going, "Ah, I just don't think I can do that. That, That's gonna be too hard. It's not going to be life-giving to me. I'm getting stressed even thinking about it, Daniel. You're looking at Sabbath and you're thinking, man, actually that would make my week harder and not easier. And and I understand that feeling. Again, I felt like that for a long time. I would hear teaching on Sabbath and I would see people who live this way and I thought, man, that seems really great, but how could I actually do that in the modern world? And it would stress me out. It seemed like it was gonna make life harder. But I think that just goes to show how enslaved we really are to our work. How much we sort of imbibed the mentality of Pharaoh in Egypt that we should just work, 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 that maybe we are just machines, that we are just robots, that we should just work nonstop. Remember, for the Israelites, for these Hebrews who were delivered out of slavery in Egypt, they did not think of Sabbath as a a burden. It was a gift. It was a blessing to them. And so for any of us who actually fully grasp what's going on with Sabbath, we're going to understand this is a tremendous blessing. Jesus even intimates this in Mark chapter 2 verse 27 when he says, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, listen, it's, it's not about just obeying some arbitrary rules out there, checking some religious boxes, as if the whole pr- purpose in God making you was so that he had little people who could honor the Sabbath. That's not what it was for. The Sabbath is meant for you. It's a blessing and a gift to you. And so, in each of our lives and in each of our contexts, there's a lot of practical things that need to be worked out if we're ever going to be good at faithfully honoring Sabbath rest. Um, and a lot of that's probably good to save for one-on-one conversation and, and maybe some guidance from people that you trust. But again, my heart today is just, I'm, I'm praying that God would help us to see the good gift of Sabbath. 
and to at least say, man, maybe I should start trying to figure out what that might look like in my life. Because on the authority of God's word, and honestly, even just my own experience with this, I can tell you this is a tremendous gift. I've, I've said it this way to people. The, the, the most important spiritual discipline, or I should say the, the most transformative and life-giving spiritual discipline that I've incorporated into my life in my, whatever it's been now, 17, 18 years as a Christian has been honestly practicing Sabbath rest. That is not, that is not to diminish the importance of every other spiritual discipline. It's just to say all the other ones were a lot easier to, to kind of tackle. I can read the Bible for a few minutes every day and pray a, a few times a day. Taking one day out of seven and stopping my work, that's really hard. But it has been so life-giving for me and for my family. And so I'm hoping that God will help us to see Sabbath as an experience of freedom from the tyranny of productivity and an opportunity for delight in the father of lights from whom all good gifts come down to us. Amen? Amen. Amen.